Greetings, everybody. This is going to be part 28, the last chapter of the uh, Judas Scepter and Joseph's Birthright. This is part 3, chapter 10. Title of the chapter is The Coming Exodus. And this is Chaplain Bob Walker, uh, John 8 12. You know the deal. Yeah, this book's been, uh, well, so far, 350 pages. Wow. So, been a busy little bee. All right, so the coming Exodus. Therefore, therefore, behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that it shall no more be said, the Lord liveth that brought up the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt. But the Lord liveth that brought up the children of Israel from the land of the north and from all the lands whither he had driven them. And I will bring them again into the land that I gave unto their fathers. And that is from Jeremiah chapter 16 and verses 14 through 15. What land is north of Israel? Take a look on a map. Europe. Yeah. But uh, your demon nominational church will... Uh, oh, no, that's not true. You know, basically, they deny what the Bible says. You know, they, they claim to love Jesus, but really they hate him and will do anything they can to deceive God's people. I mean, just look at the pre-trib rapture crowd, you know. They cannot show you not one plain, clear verse that shows you that the resurrection is is prior to the tribulation not one. Oh, they can imply it and they'll show you oh see we're going to go up but it doesn't say before no they can't show you not one thing so but you got to realize a lot of people are deceived some are deceivers others are just plain deceived so all right, let's keep reading the book. So here is a promised exodus, which is based upon the exodus of Israel out of Egypt, and which, because of its magnitude, is to so eclipse the one upon which it is based that the former will cease to be remembered. The blindest of the blind leaders of the blind claim that this prophecy was fulfilled when the Jewish people returned from the Babylonian captivity. But such could not have been the case, for the Jews went only to Babylon, and from Babylon they returned. See, it already had happened. But this oncoming exodus includes the children of Israel who are to come from all lands, whither the Lord hath driven them. When Israel came up out of Egypt, they numbered about two and a half million. This estimate is made from the fact that there were 600,000 men of war, besides the young men who were too young for war, and the old men, old men who were too old for war, and also women and children. This great company was taken out of Egypt, In a, ooh, I can't even read that word. I think it, in a body by the Lord himself with the greatest manifestations of divine power the world has ever known, will ever know, until the exodus in question takes place. But the Judeans returned from Babylon in two small companies, 
without any supernatural manifestation as to their leaving Babylon. While they were en route, and when they arrived at Jerusalem, and the divine authority of the earth declares, the whole congregation together was forty and two thousand three hundred and three score, besides their servants and their maids, of whom there were seven thousand three hundred thirty and seven, and there were among them two hundred singing men and singing women. And that's in Ezra chapter 2, verses 64 and 65. Well, I'll guarantee you, if uh, there were singing men, I was not among them. Believe it or not, um, I used to have a not a bad singing voice. And then my voice changed. And then stuck with this, right? So... Yeah, yeah, the voice changed. Used to be in a choir. No, not a church choir. Singing at uh, uh, school. But, yeah, whatever. But enough about me. But it shall come to pass in that day when the Lord shall set his hand again the second time to recover recover the remnant of his people which shall be left from Assyria and from Egypt and from Cush and from Elam and from Shinar and from Hamath and from the islands of the sea and he shall set up an ensign uh, the ensign of one who is the root of Jesse for the nations i.e. the nations into which the birthright people have developed and shall assemble the outcasts of Israel and gather the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. The envy also of Ephraim shall depart and the adversaries of Judah shall be cut off. It says, Russia, beware. Romania, beware. France, beware. Ephraim shall not envy Judah, and Judah shall not vex Ephraim. And the Lord shall utterly destroy the tongue of the Egyptian sea, and with his mighty wind shall he shake his hand over the river, and shall smite it with seven streams, and make men go over dry shod. And there shall be an highway for the remnant of his people, which shall be left from Assyria, like as it was to Israel in the day that he came up, came up out of the land of Egypt. And that's in Isaiah chapter 11, verses 12 through 16. You know, Isaiah is such an incredible book. It is so full of prophecy. I mean, Isaiah is basically a mini Bible. Isaiah has 66 chapters, 66 books in the Bible. And the first part of Isaiah is very similar to uh, the Old Testament. And then the last part of Isaiah is like the New Testament. It talks about redemption. You know, so uh, like I say, if you hit my playlist, uh, I've got an entire playlist I did on Isaiah. And it's an incredible book. It really is, truly is. I mean, uh, I think it's Isaiah 53, the suffering servant, speaking of Christ. Yeah, people. Isaiah, what a what an incredible book. So, all right, let's keep reading. Ephraim Israel is that portion of the Lord's people which is left from the Assyrian captivity, and Judah is the Judean portion of the Lord's people 
which have been scattered to the four corners of the earth. These are returned together, and for that reason one shall not vex the other. At one stage of this return, or while they are returning, the Lord is not only to destroy utterly the tongue of the Egyptian sea, but is also to dry up the seven mounts, mouths, seven mouths, the mouth, you know, mouth of a river, or delta of the river Nile. This was not done, nor could it have been done when the Judeans returned from Babylon, for these places are in diametrically opposite directions. Another feature of this returning is that in those days and in that time, saith the Lord, the children of Israel shall come, they and their children of Judah, together, going and weeping, they shall go and seek the Lord their God. They shall ask the way to Zion with their faces hitherward, saying, Come, and let us join ourselves to the Lord in a perpetual covenant that shall not be forgotten. This people did forget and did break the law covenant. But now they are going back to Zion to make an everlasting covenant with the Lord. Other features of this returning are given as follows. Behold, I will bring them from the north country and gather them from the coast of the earth. The north country, the north country. Behold, I will bring them from the north country and gather them from the coast of the earth and with them the blind and the lame, the woman with child and her that travaileth with child together. A great company shall return thither. They shall come with weeping and with supplications will I lead them. And I will cause them to walk by the rivers of waters in a straight way wherein they shall not stumble. For I am a father to Israel, and Ephraim is my firstborn. Hear the word of the Lord, O ye nations. Ephraim, the birthright people, who prior to this return have become many nations, and declare it in the isles afar off. Ephraim now living in the British Isles, and say, He that scattered Israel will gather him and keep him as a shepherd doth his flock. Didn't Jesus say that um, he was the good shepherd? Oh, yeah. For the Lord hath redeemed Jacob and ransomed him from the hand of him that was stronger than he, Therefore, they shall come and sing in the height of Zion, shall flow together to the goodness of the Lord for wheat and for wine and for oil and for the young of the flock and of the herd. And their soul shall be as a watered garden and they shall not sorrow any more at all. And that is in Jeremiah 31. Verses 8 through 13. When this return is consummated, the Lord will keep his people as a shepherd keepeth his flock. When the tribe of Judah returned from Babylon, they were not thus kept. Also, after this return has been accomplished, both Israel and Judah are to sorrow no more. But when the Judeans returned from Babylon, they had more sorrow than before. The great company sorrows while returning, but once they get to where they are to sing in the heights of Zion, um, this great company sorrows while returning. But once they're there, 
They are to be, they are to sing in the heights of Zion. Judah returned from Babylon to cry from sorrow of heart and with vexation of spirit. Furthermore, Babylon or Chaldea, of which the city of Babylon was the capital, was an inland empire and was not in possession of any island territory. Neither did they possess the coasts of the earth. Hence Judah could not have come, hence the Judah could have come neither from the coasts of the earth nor from the isles of the sea when they came from Babylon. This return is taught in that wonderful 49th chapter of Isaiah in which there is so much of the history of Israel since they went to the isles and in which is the following. Listen, O isles, unto me. Hearken, ye people, from far. Thou art my servant Israel, in whom I will be glorified. Behold, these shall come from the north and west, i.e. northwest, but when the uh, Judah returned from the Chaldean Empire, they came from the east and not the north and the west. Still other incidents of this exodus are that these people shall come upon horses and in chariots, wheeled vehicles, and in litters, or, or marginal it says coaches, and upon mules and upon swift beasts, and to my holy mountain, Jerusalem, saith the Lord. And that is in Isaiah 66 and verse 20. Also the following, Surely the isles shall wait for me, and the ships of Tarshish first, to bring my sons from far, their silver and their gold with them, unto the name of the Lord thy God, and to the Holy One of Israel. One of the results of this return is given as follows. I will bring again the captivity of my people Israel, and they shall build the waste cities and inhabit them. And they shall plant vineyards and drink the wine thereof. And they shall also make gardens and eat the fruit of them. And I will plant them upon their land. And they shall no more be pulled up out of their land, which I have given them, saith the Lord thy God. And that's in Amos 9, 14 through and 15. After Judah returned from Babylon, they were pulled up. But after this return has taken place, both Israel and Judah shall remain in their land forever. But it is also certain that this return cannot take place until Israel has been lost, increased to a multitude, and then been found. For it is written, Yet the number of the children of Israel shall be as the sands of the sea, which cannot be measured nor numbered. And it shall come to pass that in the place where it was said unto them, Ye are not, ye are not my people. There it shall be said unto them, Ye are the sons of the living God. Then, yes, then, and not until then, shall the children of Judah and the children of Israel be gathered together and appoint themselves one head, and they shall come up out of the land, for great shall be the day of Jezreel. And that is in Hosea chapter 1. Zerah, or Zera, Z-A-R-A, -A, or Z-E-R-A, is the root of this word Jezreel, and means not only the seed, but also to sow the seed, to plant. But the word Jezreel means God will sow. See Strong's Exhaustive Concordance. Hence the day of Jezreel is God's time to fulfill the prophecy given by Amos, which we have quoted above, 
i.e. I will plant them upon their land, and they shall no more be pulled up. It is because this day of Jezreel was in prospect that the Lord gave the following to the prophet Ezekiel. Prophesy therefore concerning the land of Israel, but ye, O mountains of Israel, ye shall shoot forth your branches and yield your fruit to my people of Israel, for they are at hand to come. For behold, I am for you, and I will turn unto you all the house of Israel, even all of it. And the cities shall be inhabited, and the waste shall be builded. And I will multiply upon you man and beast, and they shall increase and bring fruit. And I will settle you after your old estates, and will do better unto you than at the beginning. And ye shall know that I am the Lord. Yea, I will cause men to walk upon you, even my people Israel, and they shall possess thee, and thou shalt be their inheritance, and thou shalt no more henceforth be bereaved of them. Ezekiel 36, 8 through 12. When this return has been accomplished, Israel, all of it, shall do better than at the first. But after the Judeans arrived from Babylon, although they returned cured of idolatry, they suffered more and did worse than they did before. For they said concerning that royal prince of the house of David, let his blood be upon us and upon our children. Bob's note here. Sadly, this guy thinks the, um, well, you got to realize, Judah is mixed up with Esau and the Canaanites that run around claiming to be Judah. So they're kind of mixed together. I mean, after all, ask your pastor, hey, uh, pastor, where are the Canaanites today? Where are they? They didn't disappear from history, you know? Well, they didn't. They just changed their name. Uh, the greatest identity theft in history, if you ask me. And guess what? I've heard so-called Christian pastors tell people that we are the Canaanites. And that God opened up the door of salvation to the Canaanites. Praise the Jesus. Uh, pass that collection plate around 17 times in one hour service. Yeah, yeah, we're the Canaanites. And then they'll tell you the Canaanites that claim to be Judah are God's chosen people. Yeah. All right, let's uh, keep reading here. Also, when the day of Jezreel comes, Judah and Israel are to appoint themselves one head. It is at this time that the Lord will take the two sticks, the stick of Joseph and the stick of Judah, put them together, and they shall be one in his hand. At that time, the Lord says, I will make them one nation in the land upon the mountains of Israel, and one king shall be king of them all, and they shall be no more two nations. Neither shall they be divided unto two kingdoms any more at all. Neither shall they defile themselves any more with their idols, nor their detestable things, nor with any of their transgressions. But I will save them out of all their dwelling places, wherein they have sinned, and will cleanse them. So shall they be my people." And I will be their God. And David, my servant, shall be king over them. And they shall all have one shepherd. They shall also walk in my judgments and observe my statutes and do them. 
and they shall dwell in the land that I have given unto Jacob my servant, wherein your fathers have dwelt, and they shall dwell therein, even they and their children and their children's children forever. And my servant David, they are to gather to an ensign of a root of Jesse, shall be their prince forevermore. Moreover, I will make a covenant of peace with them. The remnant, according to the election of grace, have already found peace through Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham, the son of God. It shall be an everlasting covenant with them. They shall ask the way to Zion with their faces thitherward, saying, Come, and let us join ourselves to the Lord in a perpetual covenant that shall not be forgotten. And I will place them and multiply them, and I will set my sanctuary in the midst of them forevermore. My tabernacle, dwelling place, shall also be with them. Yea, I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And the heathen shall know that I, the Lord, do sanctify Israel, the remnant according to the election of grace made by meeting the conditions be sanctified now through the blood of the slain Prince of David, i.e. the Lamb of God that taketh away the sins of the world, when my sanctuary shall be in the midst of them forevermore. Ezekiel 37, 22 through 28. This is to be the time of the everlasting possession of the land, which God gave to our fathers. Prior to this time, it is declared, The people of thy holiness have possessed it, the land, but a little while. But in the 37th chapter of Ezekiel, prior to the giving of that part of the chapter which we have quoted, the Lord told the prophets that the valley of dry bones was the whole house of Israel, and told him to say unto them, Behold my people! I will open your graves and cause you to come out of your graves and bring you into the land of Israel. And ye shall know that I am the Lord when I have opened your graves. O my people, and brought you up out of your graves and shall put my spirit and shall put my spirit in you and ye shall live and I shall place you in your own land. Then shall ye know that I, the Lord, have spoken it and performed it, saith the Lord. Bob's note here. Obviously, this is the resurrection. And the resurrection doesn't happen until the last day, at the last trump. There's seven trumpets in Revelation, and the seventh one is the last one. There's not a last trump prior to the tribulation. And that alone proves the pre-trib rapture is a lie. I, I just, it amazes me how the Lord blinds people that, I don't know. Ken Tovin, uh, he's really good with the evolution stuff. Um, he was a pre-tripper for years and I thought, how could this guy that knows the Bible so well um, be a pre-tripper? And then he went to prison for nine and a half years or so, about over nine years. And um, he had not much else to do in prison but study the Bible. And when he got out, he was a post-tripper because he says there's no pre-trib rapture in the Bible. And all those Baptist churches that loved to have him come visit their church and fill the pews, he was no longer welcome. Oh, you don't believe in the pre-trib rapture? You're not even saved. That's our blessed hope. False prophecy is our blessed hope. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, Kent's not perfect in his theology, and I'm sure I'm not either, but, you know, 
really saddens me that uh, the deceiving Baptist churches uh, make the pre-trib rapture a condition of salvation. Really, they do when you think about it. Oh, you don't believe in the pre-trib rapture? Oh, you're not even saved. Yeah, right. Jesus said, believe in me in the pre-trib rapture and thou shalt be saved, right? Lying devils. God's going to deal with them. Keep blessing those antichrists. Yeah. Keep blessing those that hate and curse Jesus. All right, let's keep reading the book. This is to be the time of which the Lord has spoken, saying, The nation and kingdom that will not serve thee shall perish. Yea, these nations shall be utterly wasted. The glory of Lebanon shall come unto thee, the fir tree, the pine tree, and the box together to beautify the place of my sanctuary. And I will make the place of thy feet glorious. The sons also of them that afflicted thee shall come bending unto thee, and all they that despise thee, and all they that despise thee shall bow down at the soles of thy feet, and they shall call thee the city of the Lord, the Zion of the Holy One of Israel, whereas thou hast been forsaken and hated, so that no man went through thee, I will make thee an eternal excellency. Thy sun shall no more go down, neither shall thy moon withdraw itself. For the Lord shall be thine everlasting light, and the days of thy mourning shall be ended. The people also shall be righteous. They shall inhabit the land forever, the branch of my planting, the work of, the, of my hands, that I may be glorified. And that's in Isaiah chapter 60, 12, 13, 14, 15, and 20 and 21. Great violence has been done to the truth of God by those who have tried to spiritualize these prophecies instead of seeing them a time foretold during which the earth is to see its most spiritual, hence its most glorious age. For this is but the climax of the gospel error, which in the New Testament is also is often called the day of the Lord. And by the way, people, Bob's note here. Uh, there are those that will tell you that the day of the Lord and the day of Christ is two different events. Because uh, I forget which one is which. Um, but the day, I think it's the day of the Lord is the day of destruction upon the wicked. But the day of Christ is the uh, resurrection or what they call the rapture of the righteous. But they'll tell you, oh, no, that's two different events. You know, oh, the day of Christ, that's the preacher of rapture. And then the day of the Lord, that's the, you know, the wrath of God. Well, <laughs> so basically what they're doing is denying that Jesus Christ is Lord. Oh, really? The day of Christ and the day of the Lord's different? So you're telling me that Jesus Christ isn't Lord? Really? And you call yourself a what? A Christian? Really? Wires. This is the time long foretold when the wolf also shall dwell with the kid and the calf and the young lion and the fatling together and a little child shall leave them, shall lead them. And the cow and the bear shall feed, their young ones shall lie down together and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. And the suckling child shall play on the hole of the asp, and the weaned child shall put his hand on the cockatrice's cockatrice's den. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord, as the waters cover the sea. And in that day there shall be a root of Jesse, which shall stand for an ensign of the people. 
This is in harmony with Zechariah 3.10, which reads as follows. I will remove the iniquity, the sin. I will remove the iniquity of that land in one day. In that day, saith the Lord of hosts, shall ye call every man his neighbor under the vine and under the fig tree. Now these facts are in perfect accord with the outcome of the New Testament, the New Covenant, as declared in the New Testament, of which Christ is the mediator and which could not begin to come into effect, into effect until the death of the testator. So it is recorded in the book of Hebrews as follows. But now hath he, Christ, obtained a more excellent ministry. By how much also is he the mediator of a better covenant, which was established upon better promises? For if the first covenant had been faultless, then should no place have been sought for the second. Bob's note here. In other words, if the, if the Old Te Covenant, the Old Testament could have saved by law, there would have been no need for a new, the New Testament, the New Covenant, the blood of Christ. It would have been unnecessary. So when these Hebrew root fools and heretics tell you that you need to keep the law to be saved, uh, and they talk about a renewed covenant. No, it's not a renewed covenant. It's the new covenant. If the law could have saved you in the Old Testament, they would have, there wouldn't have been any need for Christ to come and die. Period. Oh, and another thing too. When uh, people tell you that uh, about the Mandela effect, and, oh, the Bible's been changed. It's not the wolf and the lamb. It was the lion and the lamb. What they're telling you is God was unable to stop Satan from changing your Bible. Yeah. So, yeah. So, if that's true, maybe we should join the church of Satan. And uh, since Satan's more powerful than God. Because, you know, God tried to stop Satan from changing his Bible and he couldn't do it. And Satan's laughing at God. Ha ha ha. God, you, you can't stop me from changing your Bible. And God's going to say, well, yeah, you're right, Satan. I wish I could stop you, but I can't. Yeah, that's the foolish morons, what they're basically telling you. You know, what people remember are these modern Bibles being read that change everything. And they're uh, remembering the satanic preachers like Billy Goat Graham doing sermons on television. That's what they remember. They don't remember because they don't read the Bible. They listen to preachers that lie. Yeah, it's the lion and the lamb. And, and, and Satan went back into a, with a time machine and he changed lion to wolf. But that's not what it really meant. I mean, it's just, you know, I, I never, 15 years ago, 20 years ago, when I was, well, 20 years ago, 20, 20, yeah, 20 some, yeah, 20, 20 some odd years ago, when I was, you know, doing the Bible college thing, I never heard of the Mandela effect. Never heard of that. And why would you name the Mandela effect after a black communist? Yeah. And I never heard of the Hebrew roots thing either. You know, <laughs> well, the, the Old Testament talks about them. They were called Judaizers. Yeah. Delete Christ and insert law. And they're a little renewed covenant. Hey, if you think keeping the law is going to save you, well, go for it, buddy boy, girly girl. All right. Um, for if that first covenant had been faultless, then, then should no place have been sought for the second. For finding fault with them, he saith, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new, new, N-E-W, not renewed, 
new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, the two houses, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they continued not in my covenant, and I regarded them not, saith the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their mind and write them in their hearts. And I will be unto them a God, and they shall be my people. And they shall not teach every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me, from the least to the greatest. Thus we find that both houses, Israel and Judah, Joseph and Judah, the scepter and the birthright, are included in this new covenant, which when it reaches its climax, must be in fulfillment of the fore foretold condition in which every man from the least to the greatest shall know the Lord, together with all spiritual and glorious results, which are described as following such a blessed and holy condition among men. Also, according to this explanation of the gospel or New Testament covenant, it is understood that our Judean brother of the house of Judah must come into this covenant before the doors of grace and mercy are closed. That part of the new covenant prophecies are quoted by the writer of the epistle to the Hebrews was given to the prophet Jeremiah, who also says in addition to that which is quoted in Hebrews, I will cause the captivity of Judah and the captivity of captivity of Israel to return and will build them as at the first and I will cleanse them from all their iniquity whereby they have sinned against me and I will pardon all their iniquities whereby they have sinned and whereby they have transgressed against me behold the days come saith the Lord that I will perform that good thing which I promised unto the house of Israel and to the house of Judah. In those days and at that time will I cause the branch of righteousness to grow up unto David, and he, the branch, shall execute judgment and righteousness in the land. In those days shall Judah be saved, and Jerusalem shall dwell safely. And this is the name wherewith she shall be called the Lord our righteousness. And that's in Jeremiah 33, 7 through 14 and 16. Still, Jeremiah prophecies concerning this time as follows. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will raise unto David a righteous branch, and a king shall reign and prosper, and execute judgment and justice in the earth. In his days Judah shall be saved, and Israel shall dwell safely. And this is the name whereby he shall be called the Lord our righteousness. Meanwhile, Paul asks, What then? And answers, Israel hath not obtained that for which he seeketh, but the election of grace hath obtained it, and the rest were blinded. It seems that the reason that Jeremiah is careful in these prophecies to say that Judah shall be saved in those days when David's king, I'm sorry, when David's son is king, is that Israel is having her opportunity now, and that all in Israel who will turn to God and serve him are, are doing so in this, the dispensation of, of the Spirit. Bob's note here. Dispensation. You'll hear that word in the demon nominational Baptist. Uh, dispensation, they'll tell you that means a period of time. No, it doesn't. Uh, dispensation means to be given something. It's from the root word to dispense. You ever heard of a soap dispenser? Yeah. It means to be given something. 
Moses, the dispensation of Moses was the law. Moses gave the law. The dispensation of grace is when Christ gave us grace. Christ dispensed grace. He gave us grace. What do you want, law or do you want grace? But the demon nominational Baptist will tell you, oh, that's a period of time. Uh, no, it's not. It has nothing to do with time. It means to be given something. I mean, there's a time when you give, you're given something, but, ugh. Boy, these, you know, the devil worked overtime. Uh, it's really sad. The Baptists will say, oh, well, we believe the King James Bible. No, you don't, you liars. No, you don't. And I went to a Baptist Bible college, so I know exactly what they teach and believe. All right, let's keep reading the book. Accepting, of course, those out of all Israel who will turn to God in the time of the Great Tribulation, which is also called the time of Jacob's trouble. Bob's note here. Baptists are going to be really surprised when they find out they ain't going anywhere and that the Christians are going to be the object of Satan's wrath in the time of Jacob Israel's trouble. Hopefully they'll be able to figure out, hey, wait a minute. We're being persecuted by those that we thought were Judah. Oh, uh, wait a minute. This don't make any sense. Maybe we are Israel. Yeah, nah, nah, they'll just deny Christ as a false prophet and take the mark of the beast. Most of them, I'm pretty sure. I could be wrong, but that's just my opinion. So, for that is the time of which it is written, they shall look upon me whom they have pierced, and they shall mourn for him as one mourneth for his only son, as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn. In that day there shall be great mourning in Jerusalem. Mourning as in sadness. And that's in Zechariah 10 and verse 11. Who was pierced? Christ, his hands and his feet. Also, his side was pierced when the Roman soldier took a, a spear and pierced his side. Now it came out blood and water. Oh, yeah. All right. Um, it was because of this that Jesus, who is Christ, the Son of God, said to the house of Judah, Your house is left unto you desolate, and ye shall see me no more until you say, Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. They had said this when he made his triumphal entry into the holy city, for they thought that the promised restoration and its attendant kingdom should immediately come. But our Lord gave them the parable of the nobleman's son going to a far country to receive a kingdom and return and gave the command, Occupy till I come. Bob's note here. Jesus told the church to occupy till I come. Now the church is abandoned. The world and allow every form of evil. They tolerate it. It's absolutely disgusting, in my opinion. You know, they ask the Lord to deliver them from the evil that they tolerate. There's a whole lot of people that should be hanging from trees by their necks. But instead, we vote them into office. Yeah. Thus, we see that the glad Hoshana, which went up from Jerusalem, was but a type. Its great prototype is ahead, just ahead as we verily believe. 
this work of planting Israel in their own land and keeping them there forever, that the Lord might be glorified, is in harmony with the following. When the house of Israel dwelt in their own land, they defiled it by their own way and by their own dealings. I poured my fury upon them, I scattered them among the heathen, and they were dispersed among the countries. When they entered unto the heathen, whither they went, they profaned my holy name. When they, the heathen, said of them, These are the people of the Lord, and are gone out of his land. But I had pity for mine holy name, which the house of Israel had profaned among the heathen, whither they went. Therefore say unto the house of Israel, Thus saith the Lord God, I do this not for your sakes, but for mine holy name's sake, which ye have profaned among the heathen, whither ye went. And I will sanctify my great name, which was profaned among the heathen, which ye have profaned in the midst of them. And the heathen shall know that I am the Lord God, when I shall be sanctified in you before their eyes. For I will take you from among the heathen, and gather you out of all countries, and will bring you into your own land. I, the Lord, have spoken it, and will do it. And that is in Ezekiel chapter 36. When this exodus takes place, and the gathering to Shiloh is completed, concerning which there are many things that we dare not mention because we cannot deal with them conclusively. It will be on such a stupendous, glorious, and supernatural scale that the Lord called John up into the heaven to give him a revelation of it, the description of which is found in the fourth chapter of the book of Revelation. Before John was taken up, a voice said to him, I will show thee uh, I will show thee things which must be hereafter. After he was taken up, and the first thing which John saw was a throne set in heaven. This signifies a kingdom. Around the throne was a rainbow, which is a symbol of the promise. Bob's note here. The rainbow was a sign of that God gave Noah that for a covenant that he would never destroy the whole earth with a flood again. The whole earth. I mean, we still have floods, but not the whole earth. And it's funny, the, uh, the devil's kids use the rainbow for their pride symbol. Yeah. Yeah, buddy boy, it's not going to be water. It's going to be fire next time. Yeah. Go Mora. So dumb. Yeah. Fire. All right. And round about the throne were four and twenty seats. Thrones, and upon the seats I saw four and twenty elders sitting clothed in white raiment, and they had in their hands crowns of gold. Bob's note Who are these twelve? Are these twenty four uh, elders? Well, I think they're the, uh, the twelve sons of Israel and the twelve apostles. Paul, not Judas Iscariot. That's who I think they are. I did a Bible study on that, if you're interested. That would make sense. You know, the 12, 12 apostles in the uh, 12 tribes of Israel, the 24. Yeah. In Christianized Israel, there are 24 elders, i.e. the 12 patriarchal sons of Jacob and the 12 apostles of Jesus Christ. Out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices these are the symbols of the judgment and in connection with these scenes we are told that the judgment was set around about the throne were four beasts or living creatures the first of these was like a lion the second like a calf or young ox 
The third had the face of a man, and the fourth was like a flying eagle. These, as we have learned, are the national ensigns of the nations of Israel. Some writers oppo oppose the translations of the original word into beasts, and others oppose the uh, translation of living creatures, but both are correct. For beasts are the symbols of human governments, and these governments are made up of living creatures. These living creatures are said to be in the middle of the throne, I'm sorry, in the midst of the throne, and also round about the throne. Hence, they represent the nations and the people of Israel under whose insignia they gather. Jehovah, by the mighty power of his own right arm, took Israel out of Egypt, and by his own glorious presence guided, protected, and led them through 40 years of wandering in the wilderness. But it is written, with many of them, God was not well pleased. Still, he withdrew neither his protection nor his manifest presence from them as a nation. Today it might also be written, with the greater portion of Joseph Israel, God is not well pleased. And yet they are manifestly the people, nationally speaking, whom he has blessed and to whom he has remembered the word of his oath. On the other hand, it is written, and many of the Judeans believed on him, and yet, nationally speaking, the Judah are the enemies of the gospel of grace. But when this greater exodus takes place, the Judeans will join with Christian Israel in shouting the glad acclaim, Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord, even as Jesus foretold when he was weeping over Jerusalem. For it is also in fulfillment of the following, the stone which the builders rejected has become the head of the corner. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day which the Lord hath made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Save now, I beseech thee, O Lord. O Lord, I beseech thee. Send now prosperity. Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. And that's in Psalms 118. 20 through 22 through 26. Thus we see that it is the rejected stone unto which they will cry, O Lord, save, and concerning whom they will say, Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord, for this is the time when the Lord himself shall appear the second time in power and great glory, at which time he will have set his hand again the second time, to recover his people, and his manifest presence shall once again be among them. When Israel was led through the wilderness under the protection of God with those four ensigns flying in the breeze, they were only three wings or encampments on each of the four sides of the great hollow square because there were only three tribes on each of the four sides. But in the revelation given to St. John for each of these four living creatures, there were six wings. We should expect this, for it is an enlarged view of the double portion of Joseph Israel. This is the gathering of the house of God, in which also there is the house of God, for it is Bethel, the stone kingdom which the Lord set up in the days of the kings of Chaldea, Medo-Persia, Greece, and pagan Rome. It is the kingdom which shall smite the image of the empire on its feet, and shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. In this kingdom are the living stones which are builded together for a habitation of God through the spirit of which Jesus Christ himself is the chief cornerstone. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church, his wife, who are to be the inhabitants of the new Jerusalem, which is to come down from God out of heaven, and which has twelve gates of pearl, each of which has upon it the name of one of the twelve sons of Jacob. But 
see the door, the uh, Bob's note here, the doors, the gates, are the 12 tribes of Israel. But in the foundation of the city are the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. And thus it is also in the double, double everlasting portion or the 24 elders in Christianized Israel to whose care was committed the shepherd stone of Israel who still have it with them and who will carry it back for it must yet become the headstone of the temple of which Ezekiel gives the plan. For in Ezekiel city there is a temple, but in the city which comes down from God, there is no temple. Um, before I read this next part, I need to explain something. I believe Ezekiel's temple is going to be here i could be wrong i'm just kind of i i'd have to do an entire study on it to be sure but ezekiel has a temple and they're actually going to be doing uh what appears to be sacrifices there this is not for the uh those that are saved in christ uh from what i understand the Old Testament methods of sacrifice will be for those who are resurrected but never died in Christ. Let me explain. What happened to all the children that died in childbirth, miscarriages, uh, abortions, uh, people that died before the age of accountability, uh, which I believe is 20 years old. You know, what happens when an eight-year-old dies? Uh, you know, so uh, they're going to have to do animal sacrifices until they make a choice. I believe that they're going to be able to grow up in the thousand-year reign of Christ. And they're going to have they're going to make a choice whether to follow the lord or to follow the devil when he's released for a little season at the end of the thousand year reign of christ and then people are going to have to decide they're going to have to decide whether to follow the lord or follow the devil and those that follow the devil will be burned up and destroyed then New Jerusalem will come down from heaven and there will be no more temple. The, the Lord himself will be the temple. Uh, at least that's how I see it. And if I'm wrong, may the Lord forgive me, but that's how I see it. But there's going to be a, a temple, uh, Ezekiel's temple. And the, the pre-trib rapture crowd uh they can't figure this stuff out. It just messes with their theology. So, but in the thousand year reign of Christ, um, there's going to be babies in, in the kingdom. And since we're not going to be, Jesus says that in the resurrection, we neither marry nor are given a marriage, but will be as the angels in heaven. And, the angels in heaven don't marry. Um, and they'll use that to say, oh, well, the fallen angels can't have sex. But it doesn't, you know, they were kicked out of heaven. They're not in heaven. They're kicked out into the earth. It's the angels in heaven that don't marry or are given a marriage. And, you know, the devil's always misapplying scriptures. Always, always, always. Yes, the fallen angels could and did have sex and had giants for children with six fingers and six toes. You know, but they want you to think that believing men married unbelieving women and had giants for children. That's what they want you to believe. Uh, Genesis 6, Job 38. Uh, just foolishness. Satanic foolishness. 
But that's my guess. Um, Ezekiel's temple will be in the millennial reign of Christ, thousand years. Milli means thousand in Latin. So the millennium just means thousand, thousand year reign of Christ. And then Satan will be loosed for a little bit. And then uh, some people will join Satan in his second rebellion and uh, fight against the Lord. They'll be devoured by fire. And then uh, God will have the new uh, heaven and earth come. So, All right, let's read the book. Page 367. It seems that one of these cities, Ezekiel's, is to be on the earth, and the other is to remain in the air. Then the following words of Jesus to Nathanael will be fulfilled. Verily, verily, I say unto you, hereafter ye shall see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. This also will be fulfilled, that of which Jacob's ladder was a type. There is also in the book of Revelation the description of a company which is composed of 144,000 persons who were redeemed from the earth and who, insofar as their nationality is concerned, are Israelites. For there are 12,000 out of each of the 12 tribes of Israel. But insofar as the moral character of this company is concerned, they are without fault before the throne of God, since he alone also brought grace to their race, has power to present men faultless through the throne of God, it must be through the atonement of Jesus Christ that these are made pure. When this gathering, which is not only the hope of Israel, but also the hope of the church of Israel takes place, then the Zerah and Zedekiah branches of the royal family of the Abrahamic people will need to abdicate in favor of he whose right it is, for he will have come. Prior to the time when the kingdom over Israel was given to David and his sons, the Lord was king of Israel. And after the enthronement of Solomon, we are told that Solomon sat on the throne of the Lord as king instead of David his father. Hence, when the Lord returns, he will have a twofold right to the throne, i.e. as the son of David and the son of God, who, when he comes, will not only be the Christ for whom the Christians are looking, but will also be the long-expected Messiah for whom the faithful ones among the tribe of Judah are looking. This present age is the dispensation of the Spirit. The dispensation which shall follow this gathering will be the day of the Lord. That is the end of the book. Bob's note here. It sounds like he's using dispensation like a period of time, which it's not. The day of the Lord. Yeah, the Lord's going to give us the day of the Lord. So, this book was copied from the library of, let's see, let me check this here. The, uh, I think it's the University, the University of Illinois, and it was, a. Uh, Stamped February 4th, 1933. About three or so years uh, after the start of the Great, what they called the Great Depression. So, I hope you enjoyed this book. And um, I certainly enjoyed it. But... Uh, when you find out who the Canaanites are and how they changed their name and you realize that there's two lines on the earth, the tares or the weeds and then the wheat, which is the bread of life in Christ, right? When you know who the players are, the Bible makes a lot more sense. So... 
All right, well, uh, all blessings, praise, glory, and honor in Jesus' precious name. Amen.